As I mentioned before, if somebody have questions, raise your hand and I'll come by with the mic. So as more early stage investors, I'm kind of curious to hear your insight on this specifically. Um, what, what helps you determine when you want to make an exit, to push a company to exit rather than continue and take an additional risk? Because we've, we've experienced things on both sides. So I'm curious to get your insight specifically from your experiences. You're absolutely right. Like at the same exact time, there can be both sides of that coin. Um, and in the same round, I bet you could have some of your investors who want to get out and some of your investors who want to double down. That wouldn't be surprising to me at all. I think that there are a lot of things that probably you as a company operator can do that are creative, like allowing some of your investors maybe to buy one another out, like the guy who wants to double down, allowing him to buy him or her to buy out the, the individual or group that, that wants out. So that's what I would say generally. I mean, of course, you know, have good you know, financial and legal counsel help you do that because you don't want any situation where somebody can come back later when you're the next unicorn and say, no, wait, I didn't get a fair shake getting out of that company. But beside that, I, I would say that it's a, it's a really tough thing, right? Um, I think the reason you invest in companies also changes as you, they move along that size trajectory. And when you start at the seed and maybe into the A phase, I think you invest in company because of the people. But at that point, from A kind of moving forward, you are investing much more based on uh, understanding unit economics, at least the way I think of investing and the way most of the funds I talk with and participate in and alongside look at it. It's people up to the A round and it's understanding uh, total addressable market or TAM and unit economics and how big that swimming pool is moving forward and how fast you can go capture so much of it. How does more capital impact your ability to do that? So I think the, the first and foremost thing I would say is allow flexibility in your investor pool. Again, even if that's uh, creative in some way, letting one investor buy another out. But I mean, I've also seen where, and, and as Alex kind of mentioned in his comments about stage of investment, uh, a lot of times by the time a company gets to a B or a C round, that big investment lead may require you if you want to take their money to require the small investors to be recapitalized out so that there's a clean cap table and all kinds of other reasons. So I think there's a whole bunch of things. But I also uh, sometimes, in a couple of the portfolio companies we've invested in, I don't want them to suffer from the venture problem where I think they may be really valuable long term but may take a little longer to get there. I also don't want a venture investor, uh, you know, I mean, so we're, I'm investing on behalf of my family so we don't have a fund life. We don't have a specific uh, time that we want to be out of investments. We want to help small businesses grow and hopefully make money and create jobs doing that. But I think that sometimes venture funds having the 10 to 12 year lifespan that they do, if, if you also get towards the end of that fund life, a fund could push a company to try and sell when it's not really the right time to do that either, simply so that they can get out and give a return to their LPs, which really has nothing to do with your company's operations and stage. So I guess I've given a whole bunch of different things that I've seen on all different sides. Again, I think there's good things and bad things. My challenge would be find the right types of investors, be creative and flexible, and if you're suffering from that problem from a fund specifically, there are other funds that will buy out late stage positions and at least refresh that life cycle, if not give you a much, much longer trajectory that they'll be glad to hold it if it's only a life cycle of fund problem, which is common. So, sorry, I said a lot. Does anybody else? Yeah, so basically the, the shortest version of what Graham said is <laughs> angel investors and angel groups it's their money. They can do whatever they want in terms of holding on for a long time or trying to get out early. Like Alex actually has no problem exiting early as long as it's the right deal, right? Yeah, I know. <laughs> the other version is though the private equity funds, venture funds, and, and any other sort of funds where they have a fiduciary responsibility to their investors have told them in general, unless it's, unless it's a different type of fund, we're going we're gonna to invest. We expect these things to exit around five years. We all know that's not really true. But around five years, and we've got a 10-year or seven-year whatever for the fund. So after three, four, five years, they're like, all right, let's move, move, move. Either you're going to be a unicorn or we're going to turn you into a pony. 
So, because um, we, we, we want to get out of here, right? And so sometimes it's more important for people with responsibility for other people's money to get the money back and also drive growth that might be dangerous, let's just say, if you can't handle the speed at which you're growing, right? That's, that's a big challenge. Yay, we got $10 million in VC. Oh, crap. Now we have to grow according to those metrics we told everyone. My question aligns with the last comment about determining the growth, and um, my question is about the relationship between the angel investors and the businesses and determining those terms and conditions and the types of contracts that are in place. Uh, it may even include an exit strategy, as well as the second part is about red flags that entrepreneurs should look for when getting into a partnership with an angel investor. The major differences between various investors is specifically the or, um, organizational structure, reporting, budgeting, forecasting. At every level, as you move up the chain from the angels all the way up to the public or, uh, or public market, um, that particular um, side of the business starts to grow and get more and more robust. So at the angel side, it, it is quite often happens that it's literally a mom, pa, or some kind of a you know a friend, or or somebody that you know who's got money. That person is not necessarily going to ask you for a full blown budget and a forecast, and they're going to see the KPIs and they want to see you perform you know within five percent of whatever you said you were going to be, or explain every difference from or deviation from the budget. As you move up, as the company moves up the stages. That's when the, the reporting, the monitoring, the uh, business growth becomes much more manageable. That's the, um, not manageable, being monitored, much more monitored. And that's, that's, when, that's where the, the goods and the bads come. The goods is you really know what you're doing and you're monitoring your business every day. The bad, if you told them a story, and that story ain't holding up. Guess what happens? So um, the second part of the question was? Red flags. Red flags. Okay. What's the number one thing investors care about? And you're probably going to be wrong, but what's the number one thing investors care about? Shout it out. Yeah. Revenue. Revenue. Revenue return. Wrong. Okay. <laughs> number one thing. That's 95% of entrepreneurs will say ROI, return, right? Revenue, whatever. It's completely wrong. So you don't have money, mostly as an entrepreneur, right? They already have the money. So risk mitigation is their number, number, number one thing. That's why a VC will look at a thousand companies and invest in one, two, three, four maybe, tops. Because they don't want to lose the money. They want to put the money with in, in a VC's case, the unicorn. In an angel investor, they may have a little bit of a more emotional, because they're not fiduciary or responsible to anybody but themselves, or in some of our angel investors, their significant other. Um, so they want to they, they want to make money, but they first don't want to lose it, right? It's a lot harder to make up for a whole lot of money lost than worry about the return that you might have made on the money you lost, right? So that's the number one thing. So you got to look at it is, all the things you're talking about, we're going to invest in 700, or we're going to take the money and do 700 different markets. No, they want you to focus on one like a laser until you make a lot of money in there. Uh, so uh, about red flags, uh, we're all human beings. We also learn from our experiences and mistakes. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur, you, you have to build a very good relationship with at least angel investors. I'm not talking about later stages, and I totally understand sales comment. But um, most of us um, are really investing not just into idea. Uh, we have our own themes, domains, industries, but we also invest in the, th in the people who run it, mostly founders. If there is no chemistry, there is definitely a um, very slim chance I'm going to invest. And uh, once again, it's built on experience. The other thing is, um, not angel, not all angel investors are the same. I personally prefer to dig a little deeper. And yes, I do read financial statements. I know how to read them, by the way. So uh, don't bullshit me, please. Um, 
and um, I um, I do uh, I do have some financial projections, uh, and of course, you know, I'm interested. I have my own team. Uh, I can talk about it off of the record, but um, it's it's very important to um, to have this relationship and expect that angel investors somehow would like to have um, frequent checkpoints, perhaps quarterly, not necessarily monthly, qu quarterly, monthly, well, quarterly reports. Uh, maybe if, if it's the same city, once a month coffee, or better yet, happy hour, of course, uh, much easier, uh, or maybe lunch. <laughs> and in general, you have to stay in touch and uh, don't, don't abandon your angel investor. They might be your best friends because they are the ones who, um, you know, deserve a little bit more recognition because we are the ones who believe in you much earlier than later stage. We are the ones taking a lot of risk. So whether you like it or not, um, we're here to stay. And there are a lot of um, companies I personally invest in where I would like to be much more involved. I might be on the advisory board. I might be informally advising them, I might be mentoring them, I might be referring some business to them. It's not just strictly financial relationship. So um, as you move up, it becomes like sales set more and more financial, a little bit more cold and distant, more focused on KPIs and metrics. But with angel investors, it's real relationship. That's how I feel. I'm sure that at times you feel like you're desperate and you, you need that money to get through the next payroll cycle, to build out the next product or service, whatever it is. But I think it's important to remember that it's a two-way relationship, right? So as much as I said, at least up to the A stage, and relationships are always important throughout that entire investing life cycle, but it's almost exclusively team. You know, 99% of the decision is team and personnel and entrepreneur based up to that A stage. And then it becomes more about financial performance and other things after that operational performance. Um, remember that that's a two-way street. So that goes not only from the investor looking at you or your team as the entrepreneur, but from you to them. So, uh, you know, I just, I had a friend send me uh, a draft of a term sheet she's considering today, actually. And she said, what do you think of this? Are these good terms? I said, oh, I don't know. No, it doesn't really seem like it. And I had a couple of other questions. I said, what do you think? She said, hell no, I don't want to take those terms. I don't want to be stuck kind of with that investor if this is what ends up happening. And I hope her business is very successful, but I'd encourage her not to take those terms. Um, regardless, you know, to some extent, you have to make that decision as the entrepreneur or the team, but basically regardless of how desperate you are, I think you need that cash. You were talking earlier about 20 different ways of funding. Um, would you be able to pinpoint something that is speaks more about uh, if you need to get assets such as real estate, equipment, what would be better for that purpose? Would it be an angel? Would it be a bank? Would it be a line of credit? What would you guys suggest in this matter? Depends on who you're partnering with, right? So you may be selling to somebody. There is customer financing. There's supplier financing. For real estate, if assuming it has some intrinsic value, um, not only will banks sometimes finance real estate, but SBAs uh, of different types uh, and or other uh, loans will also take real estate value, equipment value. So there's something that the bank can go, aha, I can get that back versus this tech app that I don't know what the heck it would be good for, right? Um, and then also um, for some of our companies, one, one of the businesses that I'm a co-founder and partner in, um, he has another business, and the the main investor, if you will, he funds the real estate, and he funds the real estate, and he overfunds the real estate a little bit um, because they're building out stuff on top of the real estate, creating greater value. So, it, I mean, for the other guy, it's no, it makes complete sense. So the entrepreneur is giving up a little bit of the, the value of the real estate in the long run, but he's getting his entire business funded because of the underlying value of the assets. Um, and revenue is almost always the best sort of funding period. So the, the joke is venture talk, we help companies grow their revenue, get funded, scale their business. What are the three things we focus on? Revenue, revenue, more revenue. 
pre-sale of, of products, pre-sale of services, pre-sale of everything. Uh, there's a, where's the guy um, who was talking to me? He's like, I'm a pre-revenue company. I got to build this tech out and blah, blah, blah. And then I was like, well, what about this? And he's like, oh, well, you know, I have these other um, clients. And I'm like, what, what do you mean you have other clients? He's like, oh, yeah, I mean, the, the, do, I'm like, are you doing consulting? He's like, yes. Are you getting paid? Yes. Is that revenue running through the business? Yes. You're not pre-revenue then. You've got revenue running through the business that you're doing consulting. Just because your tech product hasn't yet taken off doesn't mean you can't have revenue from, we'll call it other sources. That could fund the real estate or that could fund the, the thing. So combining two different revenue streams into one business could get you assets that have a value, combine all those up. And that's what really big companies do, like, like these guys are talking about too. <laughs> So for plain vanilla uh, equipment or real estate, you do need a commercial bank. And uh, again, what I found, I sit, uh, I sit on the boards of uh, private companies. And uh, the way it usually works, it's partners, owners, family members, and uh, advisors, financial advisors like me, CPAs, uh, or part-time CFOs like Sal. And it becomes very important, especially in the smaller markets, uh, to really have a personal relationship with the banker. Professionals like Sal, I'm just going to give them commercial a little bit, um, what they do all day long uh, is they go and they establish the relationships with uh, these commercial banks, the smaller ones. Well, small and medium-sized big ones. Um, and sometimes it's actually their reputation. Because uh, these bankers, they, they don't know you, they know him. And uh, if he has five or six or seven or ten of his clients who have uh, a line of credits, loans against receivables or equipment, etc., they trust him. And they know that uh, if he brings you as the client to the bank, and they look, they look at all your numbers, they look at uh, all your financials, etc., but it's what I, what I found is 50% of it's a personal relationship. So when, when you're talking about regular loans against receivables or equipment or even real estate, I would say commercial banks is the way to go. Hopefully that helps. Yeah. And I, I chime back in though on if, if for whatever reason, like the property doesn't cash flow or is not quite valuable enough and you got to build on it, getting some partner who has the, the balance sheet, like Alex or somebody, who has the balance sheet to say, hey, the banks like me, they'll give me an inexpensive loan on this real estate. You'd never get that with your lack of balance sheet slash no cash flow. But that, that's a, a way to partner up too. It, did, it didn't even probably involve real cash outlay in certain cases. Uh -huh. So you have to get creative, creative in your business, creative in, your, in the way you manage it, and so on. And the same thing as David and Paul and everybody else here that tells you it, it's all about the management team and it's all about your ability to manage the company and grow it and so on. There are real hard assets. Yes, there's easier, um, you have easier chances of getting loans from the banks. They're cheaper as well. Because you know the interest rates are a lot cheaper at a local bank than they are from a um, you know some kind of a angel investor or a specifically angel investor, because they're you know they're taking equity and equity is the most expensive thing you have. It you know it, the most expensive rate of return is on equity. So um, there are ways and there are logic and there are things that you can do. You just got to be creative in what you do. And, and thank you for the commercials. I have a small business that feeds a startup, and uh, so funding wasn't the first thing that we were looking for. We were able to bootstrap it for a little bit. Um, but Alex mentioned that you also do mentoring. How do you find a mentor for a business? Where do you go out to look for one? I'll give you a quick answer. So you had a brick and mortar business, and then you went to a more tech oriented. Okay, so we have exactly, so that's one of the things we do. We actually deal with some people who have quite successful, small or even I'll call them medium sized businesses and now they're launching a tech startup and they've had brick and mortar or whatever. And so that's one of those transitions where what you do that's successful in your brick and mortar business or whatever, 
your service business may not apply to a tech business or vice versa. And so th that's something where you can potentially join a program like VentureShop, but even more, go to some events, meet some people who might be experts in that space. And then I I'll pass it down to Alex because he's volunteered to mentor specifically for tech businesses out of like 2112. I do a lot of mentoring for Founder Institute. Uh, there's a lot of that that can be gotten for free. Remember, you get what you pay for a little bit sometimes with that, but um, I, I think there's a lot of, um, of ability to find out what type of mentors people would make, and then mentoring has a little different thing, so let's get. I just started a couple months ago, so it's pretty much, you know, kind of open calendar for, call it office days or mentoring days, you know, mentoring hours in, in that place. But uh, I agree with Dave, there are a lot of events where you can find subject matter experts and uh, surprisingly, investors and subject matter experts have something in common. They like to talk and give free advice, especially if they are drinking. <laughs> that helps. Yeah, all, yeah. Uh, so um, I guess um, in terms of free advice, it's definitely available. Uh, as a matter of fact, five minutes ago, I um, encouraged Graham to talk to Sal about one of his problems. So that's how the world is rotating, you know, it's around, uh, around your network. That is the way to uh, form advisory board and your advisors would probably be uh, very much willing to give you advice, of course, if they are qualified in exchange for a little advisory shares. Think about one to three percent of equity in exchange for qualified advice. It's also the way, but it's not free. You're giving away some equity. Outside of informal coaching, there's also formal coaching. There's obviously uh, organizations like Vistage that is specifically designed for small entrepreneurial companies that are the CEOs of these companies, and you, that's the peer-to-peer -peer coaching that you get. So, you know, CEOs of like size or like-minded companies in the same room telling you this is what I've done, this is what potentially I can do. And they also hold you accountable for the things that you say you're going to do. And then there is, of course, a, a, a my rate, you know, a number of, of certified coaches, uh, people that coach anything from, um, from um, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, entrepreneurial uh, EOS, entrepreneurial operating system, to um, you know, um, you know, integrity selling all of those, all of those programs. There is a whole host of things. Those some of them are cheap, some of them are not. So it really depends. I think my first question kind of had uh, something to do with what he was saying um, or what he asked, which is uh, the mentoring part. Um, but I guess uh, I'll add another question, which is basically, um, as a startup, how do you? Um, I guess what's the average or how do you figure out how much equity to give up versus funding from a uh, VC or uh, um, angel? A lot of times equity is a function of the value creation that that individual group or person is going to bring, right? So at VentureShot, we specifically are not an accelerator even though we accelerate revenue, growth, and funding. But if you go to a Techstars or Y Combinator, you may give up 6 to 10% of the company for a very small amount of money, but you're supposed to get a whole lot of help and maybe some funding, and that's the purpose of it. For advisory shares, as Alex mentioned, it might be half to 3%. Could be less, could be more, but somewhere in there. But for the funding perspective, VCs have a different formula than angels, right? They need to have a certain amount because they're counting on getting diluted if assuming you're going to be a huge unicorn Facebook-y sort of thing, which you probably aren't going to be, but that's okay. They, they're only going to invest in you if you've got a shot at doing something of significance, right? Nine figures, 10 figures in, in, in value, because that's the only way they make money, kind of, sort of, but they get fees too. Um, so the, the punchline, the only way they make the big money is big hits, right? Home runs, quadruple, quintuple, 15x home runs. So they're going to want a lot of equity relative to the dollars they put in, but they're probably going to put in a lot more dollars than an angel. An angel might have many reasons to invest other than just the equity. They may want to exit earlier on, get bought out, take the risk off the table. They may want to do follow-on rounds. 
and they, they may have strategic customers, partnerships, or whatever that they can bring to the table too, and that could increase the value of that angel versus somebody just throwing cash at you, right? So it, it, it's, it varies, but there's some very specific reasons. And again, a very, I don't want to say stupid, but a very simple, cheap way, take angels or VCs or whoever out to lunch. I know they have the money they should probably pay, but that's not how it works. But you're basically just showing them that you respect their knowledge and their, their thing. And Alex said, man, you get, you get Alex drinking her food, he'll start talking. He'll start talking. He'll tell you everything. As I said, I go to Silicon Valley often, and um, I'm not sure if everyone had this expression, my touch. My touch comes from Greek mythology, right? And basically, there are some investors that have uh, my touch. What it means, whatever they touch turns into gold. So small angel investors like me would like to find lead investor that has this Midas touch. If they invest, everyone else comes across and it's not a bad proposition. So you probably understand that those early stage Midas touch investors were very early in Airbnb, Uber, probably in uh, maybe even Facebook back then, Twitter when it was still going up, not down uh, trajectory. So. Um, you might want to uh, look up those investors, right, with my touch. If you have access to them, just, you know, at the event, they might be speakers. Don't hesitate to talk to them. Uh, they, uh, if, they be, if they believe in you, that's, that's uh, much better than, uh, than uh, average angel investors or something like that. Because their track record, nine out of ten, not one out of ten. There are very few of those. I mean, I met those people and they're amazing. They have this intuition. So don't, I mean, don't be greedy with equity sometimes. Please. And it's difficult to assess what the value of that is or is going to be. And if you look at the multiples that even publicly traded technology companies trade at, in particular, they vary, I think, wider than most other industries because there's so much variance in what the value of technology is. So especially in an early round, especially if you're pre-revenue, uh, especially if you're pre-product, if, if some or in many cases all of those things fit, um, I don't want to say it's more of an art than a science, but it might be more of an art than a science, picking valuation in some of those earliest rounds. I mean, I can definitely tell you the way I think about it, because I'm both an entrepreneur and an investor, but I, I can tell you, you know, a lot of times it's pretty simple math. Hey, we need three hundred thousand uh, dollars. Let's give up no more than twenty percent of the company. Okay, the pre-money values, the post-money values, one point five million dollars. I mean, there's no magic to that in a lot of cases. Again, if you show me a real estate proposal, I can tell you what the value is based on some blend of its location asset value and the cash flow you derive from it. And that's just because it's a, it's a much more known quantity than an app or some other type of technology. It's a lot harder to value those, especially in those earlier rounds. So my genuine opinion is it is much more often an art than a science. I mean, hey, a painting yesterday, I think, if I'm getting the story right, sold for $450 million, which I think set a new high record for a painting that was once accidentally mistaken and sold for $59. So what is something worth now versus what it's gonna be worth in the future? I mean, people can be wrong on all sides of that. I bet the thing by Leonardo da Vinci or whatever it was was never worth $59, obviously. I don't understand how it can be worth 450 million, but someone paid that. So uh, I don't know that that point exactly translates. It was just a funny story I saw, I guess. <laughs> but in any case, I think a lot of times at those earlier rounds, it's what you see in it and what you can convince those earliest investors to believe in. That being said, the entrepreneur and the team have a lot more impact and the personal relationship you probably have with your earliest investors is what allows you to set those terms. So you're playing sometimes from more of a position of strength than you initially think. So we have a company, Fan Food. They're probably going to raise about a million and a half dollars here. They were only raising two hundred fifty thousand dollars like two weeks ago, but uh, they 
they, they hit some metrics and they're kick, knocking it out of the park, pun intended. And they, uh, the first in, uh, investor I introduced them to, instead of developing the relationship, so advancing the relationship, developing the relationship, I was like, hey, meet these guys. You know, I'm going to introduce you to them. We'll go talk to them. He's like, oh, hey, great, great to meet you. You know what? We need to raise our capital in about four weeks. Um, so if you can kick us some money right now, but if you think about a relationship, like, do you go out and say, hey, let's get married and have a kid tonight? <laughs> most of the time, no, right? Too many cocktails? I don't know what you do, but most of the time, no. And so if you think about developing a relationship and advancing the relationship, uh, a business or angel funding relationship, it's not crazy different than a personal relationship. So if you're like, no, I'd never go say, let's get married on the third date, then don't try and do it right then. You talk about the business, you, you go find out about them, you find out what makes them tick, right? Alex is very unlikely to invest in companies that don't have a significant technology component. So if you're asking them to fund a jump around for kids, right, you know, probably not gonna do it. He does have kids, he might do something else for kids, but not probably that, right? So it's super important to build that relationship up before you need the cash. And if you already need the cash, start building now. What, Warren Buffett probably says it best. What's, what's the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. When's the second best time to plant a tree? Now, right? So st start building that relationship now, plant the tree. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone who came this evening. Just a reminder, our next event will be on February 22nd here at Kuwait. Um, keep an eye for our text reminders and emails. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Bamont Rendezvous. And uh, thank you very much all for coming. We appreciate all of and every one of you. Thank you.